Today is the second Sunday of Easter, and for the next probably month, we're going to be looking at the epistle lessons from 1 Peter. Uh, if you would like to, I'm not going to read the text right off, so if you would like to, turn to 1 Peter 1, verses 1 to 9. That's what we'll be looking at today. And there's so much in here that uh, I'm just going to barely scratch the surface on it, but we'll give it a shot. There's a question that is often used by people to disprove the existence of a loving and forgiving God. The question is, if God is good, then why does he allow suffering? It really is a good question, but it doesn't disprove anything about God. In fact, most world religions don't even deal with the problem of suffering. Or they deal with it in strange ways. Buddhism, for instance, deals with suffering by saying that you should someday achieve nirvana. And if you achieve that, you have received the ultimate goal of life. The word nirvana literally means liberation or extinguishing, like blowing out a candle. Some well-known Buddhists, some of whom I was not aware of, are Richard Gere, Leonard Cohen, the Dalai Lama, of course, Tina Turner, Steven Seagal, and perhaps the most famous, at least today, ta-da, Tiger Woods, who claims to be kind of a Buddhist, whatever that means. The ultimate goal of Buddhism is to escape life and suffering by dissolving into nothingness like a snowflake dissolving on a warm sidewalk. Someday I will be nothing. My existence will have meant nothing. I will never live again. Boy, I feel better already, don't you? The young atheist lawyer who became a Christian recently wrote in a blog where he confessed that it was Christianity's position on suffering that ultimately brought him to faith in Jesus. For him, Christianity was the only religion that dealt with the problem of suffering head-on without trying to deny it or escape from it. Even the symbol Christians wear to identify themselves is about suffering. Christians don't wear the symbol of a cloud or a star, a rainbow or an angel. Instead, they wear the symbol of a cross. A symbol of terrible suffering and death. And that's basically what 1 Peter is all about. Suffering, its purpose, its goal, its benefit. And we'll be looking at it for several weeks. Peter begins his letter this way. You can follow along. This is from the ESV. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to those elect exiles of the dispersion, in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now that's kind of the introduction. I'll skip a sentence here. Then he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Now Peter reminded those early Christians and us where we came from, who we are, why we are so confident in our faith in spite of suffering. And he starts off by blessing God, which seems kind of strange, doesn't it? Because shouldn't God be blessing us? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, he writes. Well, that's not so unusual. David in the Old Testament in the Psalms said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. While there are many things to bless God for, Peter reminds us that one of the things that we bless God for is our future inheritance. Everything we have in this world, everything we know, 
Everything we desire is perishable, impure, and fades away. We buy a new car, a new house, a new gizmo, new clothing. But it gets old, it wears out. Look around your house for a minute. Think of all the stuff that once meant so much to you and now means less and less as time goes by. I love these three words Peter uses to describe heaven. He says, it is an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. If you can, try to remember the feeling of joy that you had when you received something that you had longed for. Maybe it was a possession, maybe it was a relationship. You felt a surge in your heart, a swelling in your chest, a tear of joy maybe, a, grasp, a gasp of excitement. But that feeling only lasted for a moment, maybe a few seconds or maybe for a few hours or days. Imagine having that feeling all the time. Overwhelming joy, excitement, and pleasure all the time. That's just a, a taste of what heaven will be like. Imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Peter goes on. Kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation which is ready to be revealed in the last times. And then he says, in this you rejoice. What Peter's saying is that we have to keep our mind and our heart on what God has in store for us in the near future. Because, he says, for a little while you have you have been grieved by various trials. Now, various trials is an interesting phrase because it's quite an understatement for those early Christians in Asia Minor. Various trials for them meant imprisonment, beatings, for some of them torture, and for others, death. Now, people still suffer today, though most of it isn't for our faith, at least in this country. Those suffering from cancer, coronavirus, loss of a loved one, separation from family, financial worries, have a difficult time seeing it as a short-term, temporary situation. Now, Peter doesn't diminish suffering. He says, he's, he's not saying it doesn't matter. Suffering is real and painful, and when you're in the middle of it, seemingly endless. But suffering for our faith has several positive purposes. One of them, he writes, is this. He says, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm sure you're all dying to know what my favorite candy bar is. It's Lint, L-I-N-D-T, 78% dark chocolate. It costs $3 for three and a half ounce bar. And even though that's less than a dollar an ounce, according to my wife, it's way too expensive. Well, I point out to her, not compared to gold, the price of gold is $1,657 per ounce as of Saturday. Peter says that our faith is more precious than dark chocolate. It's more precious than gold. Gold is purified by heat, he says. Faith is purified by suffering. Fire burns away impurities. Suffering in the life of the Christian burns away our selfishness, our greed, our fear, our entitlement, our sinful desires. And the only thing left is Jesus. And that's gold. And then he concludes this section. He says, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him. And rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Obtaining the outcome of your faith, which is the salvation of your souls. 
there is a lot of suffering in the world. There always has been. For a Buddhist, all they can hope for is to escape into nothingness, which, if you think about it, is also the end goal of atheism. To be nothing, to mean nothing, and to hope nothing. For us, as gods, and this is the way Peter describes us, elect exiles of the dispersion. Suffering is temporary. It is expected, it is necessary, and it has a positive purpose. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Lord bless you and keep you. Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.